Before we get started, I want to personally invite you to join me for a live FinTech Leaders recording and happy hour with Stuart Sop, CEO and co-founder of Current, a multi-billion dollar FinTech built in New York City. Join us at Barclays Rise New York on Monday, October 16 to kick off New York Tech Week. You can visit the show notes on FinTech Leader Substack to find the registration link. See you there. The trick about competition is you need to fundamentally be playing like a, a different game than the competition. It can look competitive from the outside because there's a lot of folks doing similar features. But if your customers think of you differently, it might not matter. The qualitative feedback from people once the experience got too easy is that it was scary. And the feedback was like, this is my finances and I expect there to be friction and I expect it to feel like, like it has weight. And if you make the UX instantaneous, like scans your face, connect your bank account, click once, it's jarring for people. I'm proud to be here. You know, it's always cool when you hear yourself on something that you listen to. Hello, everyone, and welcome to FinTech Leaders. Coming to you from New York City, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa. I'm a co-founder of Gilgamesh Ventures, a venture capital fund that backs early stage FinTech entrepreneurs in the US, Canada, and Latin America. If you enjoyed this conversation, I invite you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your show so more people can learn about FinTech Leaders. In this episode, I sit down with Jean-Denis Grez, CTO at Plaid, a data network and one of the foundational fintech companies that works with thousands of companies, including several Fortune 500 and some of the largest global banks. Founded in 2013 by Zach Parrott and Willing Hockey, Plaid's network covers over 12,000 financial institutions across the U.S., Canada, UK, and Europe. They've raised over $700 million from Felices, Homebrew, NEA, Spark Capital, City, Goldman, Amex, Ribbit, and just a long list of great investors. We discuss in this episode how Plaid stays at the forefront of security and privacy, thriving in a competitive market and how the only way to win is to play a different game than your competitors, the future of open finance in the US and some regulatory predictions, how AI LLMs are revolutionizing user interfaces, and just a lot more. Jean-Denis, how are you, man? I am great. Hi, Miguel. It's great to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Welcome to Fintech Leaders. You know, we we have someone, you know, to, you as CTO of Plaid have a lot of context on the entire industry. You're a bit of a backbone for, for our industry. And so I think your perspective is going to be super valuable. Before we start talking about Fintech and Plaid, I have a question. How does a lawyer go to director of engineering to CTO, or maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe it's why does an engineer decide to go to Harvard Law School? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I look, I've been tinkering my whole life with computers. My dad got me like a Commodore 128, a not very popular successor to the Commodore 64 when I was, you know, something like seven years old. So I've, I've always been playing with computers and, and I studied computer science in, in college in the US and my first two jobs out of school were, were as a software engineer. And, but then what happened is I burnt out. And I was, I was in grad school for CS, kind of studying to get a PhD. And I just hit a wall where I, I didn't love what I was doing. My advisor changed schools. And I kind of didn't know what I want to do with my life. And I was in my early 20s. It was kind of my first experience with you know failure uh, and self-doubt. And well, not first, but first big, big one. And I decided I needed to do something else. And in, in America, and I, you know, the audience here is from all over the world. So 
this may not make sense to everybody, but actually America has a very legalistic culture and actually having a law degree in the US can allow you to do many things, right? It doesn't really force you to become a, a, a lawyer lawyer. And so I decided I needed to do something different and expand my skill set. And there's no way I could get into business school because I just spent too much time in, in academia. And law school is just looking for for smart folks. I'd always loved history. And so I kind of applied and kind of did well enough in whatever the application process was that I ended up being able to go to Harvard Law School. And I, I loved it. It was very much like a mind expanding experience. And Harvard's just wonderful. I was able to take classes, you know, outside of the law school and and I came out of that and I was a lawyer for one year and I survived 12 months, like barely. And just, there's no equity involved, but I, I did my one year cliff as an associate at this kind of great international firm called Sullivan and Cromwell. And I just didn't like it. And I didn't want to be more importantly, the partners. I saw what they did 10 years later and I was like, I just, they're really smart. They love what they're doing. I just don't want to do what they're doing. So I got to ask you, sounds like it's not similar to the show Suits. Unfortunately, I don't watch the medias, and so I don't know what Suits is. But whatever television portrayal you have of being a lawyer at a big firm, I can guarantee you it's not that, except if it's just people <laughs> reading documents late into the night and being asked to stay over the weekend to work on deals that involve you know 100-page documents. That was much more my experience. Very intellectually interesting, but you have to love the law in a way which I just didn't. Is that the show Suits, or is there something different to that show? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's you know this is just, it's an old show, but it's it makes the job seem very glamorous. But yeah, my co-founder went also to Harvard Law School and ended up being a lawyer, and I did a little bit like you, lasted just enough to know what's up. So after being, you know, a lawyer, a practicing lawyer for twelve months, you drop your bar license. And you go back to what had burned you, you know, in the first place. Is that, is that kind of how, how it went? That's right. I mean, the, the, my description of it is every perspective in life is very important. And it, it felt like my worst day as an engineer was better than my best day as a, as a lawyer. And so, and also I'd burned burnt out on being a grad student, which is a different beast. I, I like to see the impact what I do day to day. I like to see customers. I like to you know, the, the really fast feedback cycle of writing code. And so I just went back to work for a small company that was building software in the travel space. And I kind of did that for a bit and it was fun. And then I helped a friend build a trading system for, for hedge funds and a backtesting system. And that was super, that was great. I mean, that was like the fantastic, like hard code, hard technical problems, a lot of impact that you would see quickly. And then eventually made my way to Silicon Valley to work at Dropbox, which is like an incredible experience, hyper growth, you know, a product that was used by hundreds of millions of people. And I like that. I like that impact, that feeling of like technology is being used by real people and you can connect those two things together. And yeah, again, whenever I have a bad day, I just, I realize that I'm like pretty close to my optimal profession because I've done something that I just wasn't, you know, in love with and I wasn't suited for. And that, that carries me through a lot of, you know, dark moments. We all have dark moments, tough moments, but I'm you know, I'm step back and I'm like, I, I love what I do and I'm so lucky for that. So tell us about your time at Plaid. It's, it's been a long time, close to the beginning, seven years. How has you know, your timing at the company evolved? Because you, you actually didn't start as CTO, right? I, I believe you started as a director of engineer. Yeah, I, I came in to, to run the engineering team. I was head of engineering for my first like, I don't know, three or four years and then eventually took on product and design and kind of got a, a promotion to CTO to run the whole the whole product and technical side of the org. Yeah, I mean, look, it's hard. For me, I, I feel luck. When you ask me like, oh, what has it been like at Plaid? My first response is like, ah, I am so lucky because I joined a company that had the potential to be like truly trans transformational and, and big and, and meaningful for people. You know, there's a lot of luck in that. You know, I, I joined initially because I thought I thought the product was very cool. It's rare. There are not that many like platformy companies that whole ecosystems are built on top of. And even seven years ago when, when Plaid was quite small, because there were customers like Robinhood or Venmo that were already on it, you had the sense that like, hey, there's going to be a whole wave of innovation that was going to happen on top of the platform. So when I joined that, that was very attractive. And then the culture of the company still to this day is very pragmatic and very impact focused. And like... 
there's this little talk that I give to new interns at at Plaid and people ask me like, what do you need to do to be a successful engineer, like career advice? And I was like, well, you have to be really comfortable, you know, transforming strings into strings. You know, like a lot of engineering not like you're not doing the world's like hardest, you know, distributed system problem. Sometimes you just have to like do simple things over and over again and do it cleverly and and so on. But, you know, we're just moving like, like letters around the internet and, and it's not, sometimes not as glamorous as people make it out to be. But what I love about Plaid is whatever you ask people on the team to do, any team member, any function, as long as you can point them to impact for customers, even if the task isn't glamorous or exciting, like people at the company will just do it because they they are really aligned with that business impact and that customer impact. And I love that. And you could see that like in my interview process compared to other companies, I was like, this is like a no bullshit. Like we're trying to help consumers. We're trying to help our customers kind of company. And that really resonated with me. Yeah. And then you you said it before, like one of the funnest parts about the job, apart from the technology, is just you're at the center of an ecosystem, right? And you see people solve new problems for users in the fintech space, right? And so you you saw, we saw the rise of neobanks and crypto and like online brokerage and, and live lending and pay like pay advances. And then you, you see older spaces move to it. Like you see like, huh, like mortgage lending, which for a long time, even a few years ago, is like lots of stacks of paper that you'd have to walk into your bank with, like starts to go digital and you can have a player like Rocket Mortgage, largest mortgage lender in the United States, right? Rocket, like they use Plaid. Right, they're like a. It's a very digital first experience in that space, and and they're the largest. I Means they've they've there was nothing there like 15 years ago, and they they've crushed it. They've crushed this market. So it's really exciting to to see that from the inside. And you know, we're lucky that I'm connected to like the CEOs, the founders, the CTOs, the CPOs at all of these companies, and you know, I can like you know, I go to New York and have dinner with a bunch of them, and that's a that's a really fun part of of the job for me. I want to zoom in on something you mentioned, and that's the fact that you've created a platform on which part of an entire industry or ecosystem has been built, right? And and that's important. And there's an argument, I don't know if you agree with me, but there's an argument that Plaid is close to or is systemically important. And, and that probably adds a bunch of requirements and, and expectations, right? Of on you have to be up, you have to be running, right? So internally, how do you think about that? But also, how have you structured the technology so it works the way it does today? Yeah, I don't. I think my answer will end up being generic. I think of, at, once you get to any scales of you know tens to hundreds of millions of people using your online service, it feels like you just can't be down. And granted, if Plaid is down, someone can't apply for a mortgage. And so it's like, you know, damn, right? That maybe feels more or less important than like sharing a picture with friends. But I think actually universally in my experience, regardless of the importance of the use case, like people now expect services to be up all the time. There's not a ton that we've done that special. I think, you know, the usage of Plaid has, has like two vectors to it. There's usage where there's a user present. That is, there's a human that's trying to do something on a device. And what we've tried to make sure is every service that is invoked, like every part of our technology that's invoked when that happens, there we have extremely rigorous uptime requirements. And, you know, as we move towards use cases like daily payments and things like that, basically you can only be down, you know, a few minutes a month. Like maybe people have tolerance for five, six minutes of downtime a month. But then there's a whole bunch of plaids infrastructure. That's what I would call like offline, meaning you know, if we're down for 20 minutes or we're a little bit slower at processing a transaction, like it's not the end of the day because there's no one that's waiting for the thing to happen. They just expect it to eventually get done. And that's actually a majority of our services. I would say like, you know, 70, 80% or, or more around these interactions that aren't, that just don't need to work, work, work. And that distinction at most software companies is really important. Like you should think about what's the critical path for things where it just destroys the user experience if it doesn't work. And in those things, you're just more careful. You know, when you ship code, you're more careful. You roll it out more slowly and things like that. And then in the places where if you make a mistake, it's just not the end of the world. So you have an analytics pipeline 
that you're running like every 30 minutes, right? Like if that's down for a 30 minute cycle, like it's not the end of the world. Like no one's, no one's dying or not getting their money because of it. And those things there, you could move really quickly and you don't have to put as, as much rigor, so to speak. So I think we kind of separate, you know, the critical path from non-critical path work. And that's a pretty common approach in, in tech. But just every any technology company, whether it's fintech or not, will have a critical path that it turns out really, really matters to their to their users. I think the the other two things for Plaid that I worry just as much about than uptime or would be like security and privacy, because I think that's where the like when you're in fintech, taking it very, very seriously is is critical because it's based on trust. Like all financial services at the end of the day, actually it's the the real industry is trust, right? When Someone goes to you, Miguel, and they're like, hey, can you loan me $5? Really, it's just you're making a trust decision. Do I trust this person, right? That they'll pay me back. Do I trust that they have any income? Like, will I see them again? And so, you know, from a technical perspective for us, trust is, is privacy, meaning, you know, there's very important data that our users are using Plaid to share with apps that they want to use. And they need to feel really comfortable that we're doing right by that data and that the the platform, meaning the apps built on top of Plaid, are also doing right by that data, right? Because you only trust a platform as much as you trust everyone that's on it, right? So for me, us, that just means like we have to handle the data, data well, but we have to make sure our customers and the customers that we onboard are also doing right by you know people's privacy. And then on security, it's the exact same thing, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. And so, you know, they're unlike the critical path stuff for uptime where you can isolate critical path, you know, security is your entire surface area, right? Like they could be a gap anywhere and and something bad could happen there. So those actually, I would say privacy and security for me are much more top of mind than uptime at this point. I think we have mostly, I'm not saying we figured out uptime, right? And bad things can always happen. Like a big fintech was down for close to 24 hours this week, for example, and they're bigger and public company, like very mature. And we look at that and we're like, okay, cool. We can be better at uptime, but you know, security and privacy is, is where I'm really proud of, of where the team has landed and, and our level of execution. And for other CTOs tuning in on, or CEOs, company leaders in general, how should they be thinking about security and privacy? Obviously huge topics. I've, I've had the good fortune to bring a few of the anti-fraud leaders from our industry on the podcast. And, you know, they, they all bring crazy new use cases that we should be thinking about. But what's your approach here? I mean, again, I'll say for both of them, my approach was to hire a really great leader that understood the space really, really well. And I think for, you know, for, for security, there's like, you're talking about fraud and risk. Like fraud and risk, you can measure every day. How much fraud are you seeing? How much risk are you exposing yourself or your users to? How much, you know, if you're a lender, how much reserves you need? Like that, you, you can do these kind of evaluations. I think a lot of security is about tail risk. It's like low odds of something really bad happening. And so it's hard to measure. Do you know what I mean? Like you, there are ways that you can attempt to do it. But really, you need to have someone in a team whose judgment you trust to make the right calls on on tail events. And I, I think that's, for us, I looked at it and it was like, okay, we need a great leader. But we need language that we can talk about this with the board. And if you don't have those two things, like, you know, language of the board means some level of accountability, but then a great leader, like someone who really breathed this mindset because it's a different mindset, it doesn't work, right? I'm the CTO, I'm responsible for, you know, engineering product design. So for product goals, I'm trying to drive conversion. I'm trying to drive revenue. I'm trying to drive product usage. So my brain is going like these very concrete things that you see metrics drive up day after day. And I, you need someone else that sits next to you that tells you like, no, this is the long-term risk. This is how much we need to invest now. There's some intuition to it, but like we're not investing enough relative to the size of this risk. This is how we get to where we need to be. And it's hard to wear both of those hats because there's such different time scales, right? And then I think privacy, you need to define what you what you are okay doing with people's data and what you are not. And you need a really bright line on privacy. Privacy is not about risk, right? It's it's like it's like, do you do access the data? Like, do you sell the data to ad networks? Like you do or you don't, right? You need to set the bright rule. Okay, why don't you? Okay, we only use data for 
the use case that the end user authorize. Our end users authorize their data to be shared with a fintech app for brokerage. It has nothing to do with advertising. So it's really easy for us to say like, no, we're not going to do that bad thing, right? But you need those bright principles. And I think the way I look at it is, can everyone look at the principles and go to sleep at night and tell their kids what they do and be really proud of it? Like, you know, and if you can do that and you have the principles, then it just becomes a communication exercise, right? Does everyone on the team understand the principles? Do we have in your product development process, you have a step where, you know, a privacy council or your chief privacy officer can look at it and be like, yep, it, it abides by the principles. It's like way below the, you know, it's way above the line. And that's about it. But you need to define them because I think where I have seen people get in trouble is when you're just making a lot of ad hoc decisions without something to stand on, right? Because the problem with ad hoc decisions is there's always business reasons that push on things like privacy all the time, right? And you 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 don't even want to contemplate them. And so if you have the principles, you don't even like start to have the BD discussion or whatever. You're just like, no, we just would never do that. That's not who we are. Right. I think the danger sometimes can be, and this would be my advice to like, you know, CEOs and CPOs generally is where you start to explore things that are kind of at the edge. And then there's a really good business reason to do it. And then you're like, oh, well, we're going to move the edge a little bit because we want to make an extra 10 million. And you do that too many times. And then you just, you got nothing left. Whereas if you have the principles, you can stop yourself early enough from, from ever going to those places. And it, it actually constrains you and allows you to build a better business, I think, in the long term. Like, I think privacy done really well is a will be a competitive advantage in the world. Like I think it is a competitive advantage. I mean, it's been weaponized by some companies too, but like it matters to people. And when you're in financial services, if people don't trust you, I think end game you don't you will not have a valuable business. Yeah, and if they do, they'll they'll come to you. Since you are also leading the product organization. I'm curious on your point of view on how you think about the competition, right? Especially in your space, primarily bank linking. I know Platt does more. Because let's be honest, it's gotten increasingly competitive in the last few years, right? More so than it was five years ago. So yeah, tell us about your point of view here. The trick about competition is you need to fundamentally be playing like a, a different game than the competition, it can look competitive from the outside because there's a lot of folks doing similar features. But if your customers think of you differently, it might not matter that there are people who have what looks like externally similar capabilities. So look, for, for Plaid for a long time, the way I thought about our competitive advantage was economies of scale. And I still think that matters a lot today. Economies of scale means we derive, we make more revenue from the 10,000 banks in the US that we're connected to than anybody else. And that just means we can invest more in having better connections with those banks, better data quality, cleaning the data more. And the products might be similar, but we'll have a much higher margin like profile because, because we can deliver better products and spread the cost across a lot more revenue. So that's like one thing. So from the outside, it, it may look similar, but actually the data quality is better, the conversion is better with Plaid, and we have higher margin, and that all adds up to a better business. So I think that's like one part of it. But then you, you do want to play a different game than other people. And I think a lot of our customers don't really think of Plaid anymore as just connecting the data. They look at the services that we provide next to that that others don't or can't. So like the, the clearest example for me right now would be our Signal product, which is like a it's a fraud product that you use so that you can use ACH and make it, make it, make, making it feel like the, movie, the, the money moves instantly. And you can do that because we basically tell you, like, this is not a fraudulent transfer. The funds will arrive for sure, treated like they're already there. And that changes ACH. Like, now it's not just about whether you're getting your account and routing number. It's like you get account routing number and you're sure it's the right person. And so you can, you can act with the money instantly. And that's super powerful. It's real-time transaction without being a real-time transaction. Exactly. It gives you that feel. And, and I think that's like a lot of customers, you know, this like our fastest growing product and they pay us for that. And they view us as the kind of company that can build those products and will keep innovating and having things like that that others don't. And the underlying thing for us, like it's like 
we think of us as ourselves as having network effects and we're a network. So the reason why our fraud product is better, by the way, is because the data that it's trained on is the data of these tens of millions of financial connections across thousands of apps and like seven to 10 years of historical data. And from that, we can build a better fraud model. And the best part about it is customers use Signal, they tell us when they see fraud or when they see other kinds of risk. And then we use that to make the model better, which gets more customers because they notice that it's even better than competitors. And then they channel more data back to us. We make the model better. We make more money from it and so on. And once you have that network effect around a data product, it's super powerful. And so the game that we're playing right now is how many products can we build that have these network effects? We're not playing the game of like, should we connect to bank 10,001 or 10,002 and leverage our economies of scale? I mean, we're still doing that because that's a core part of our competitive advantage still. But long term, there's so much competitive advantage, so much economics to be derived from things like identity verification, fraud protection, fast money movement, credit, credit scores and credit reports. And that's what we really focus on because for all of those, like we are building network effect products in them. And then the, the final part to all this, like I think about competition, you know, what I don't like about Plaid's product today, like the thing that drives me nuts is that you, Miguel, who connects your third app, you mostly have the same experience as when you connected your first app. And you just shouldn't. It should be a different and better experience every time you interact with the Plaid network because we've seen you before and we trust more that it actually is you. And so like, that's the North Star. And I think we're playing that game and I just don't think any of our competitors are playing that game right now. I'm sure some of them are listening to this and that's great. And, and But like, and I think because we are bigger, we will be able to leverage those network effects and build experiences that other people can only dream of. And, and so that's our that's our that's our strategy, our product strategy right now. And in two, three years, once we've done that and maybe a few other people have as well, I will have another answer on product strategy of how we stay ahead of the competition. And so that's how we stay ahead. And competition is good, right? Like another way to look at it is look, man, there's like hundreds of millions of people who rely on open banking and open finance. And it's, it's very valuable. And that's why other people are getting into it. And that's awesome. Like another way to look at it is like, whether we achieve the mission or someone else does, I think the world of open banking and open finance, like it's here to stay for the long term. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very happy about that. And if we don't win it all and someone else does, like that's life. It's still so good for consumers, right? Competition is good for consumers. So I find it super interesting that you're saying open finance, open banking is here to stay. In many places, it's been codified by law. I was just in Brazil three weeks ago, met with one of the the head of regulation for the central bank, and he's super proud of their open finance regulation. And you go to Singapore, UK, similar. Here in the US, it's been it's been more it's been like hacked by the financial private sector, to, but we have the same result, right? Or, or a very similar result. You think we'll we'll see legislation in the U.S.? I mean, for sure. I think we'll see very soon. I'll get into that. I mean, look, different countries' regulatory regimes have fully different philosophies about how do you promote innovation and how do you promote great services, right? And so in the U.S., the historical model is to let competition happen. And from competition, you get good products or good companies. And then usually the regulators come in after a little bit of time and they codify what they think are the best practices from the competition that's happened. That's not always what happens in the US. Like sometimes they deregulate ahead, like the cable industry in the 1970s is an example. So this is not just one model, but often in the United States is like, let the market forces play out and then protect the market in some way and shape it based on what you've seen in practice. I think in Brazil and, and in India, w- what's happened recently really around like bank payments is actually fascinating because they... In Brazil, especially, they were like, this is how it's going to work. This is how the UX is going to be. All the banks have to do it. And they did a really good job. And I mean, you look at, you look at like the curve of usage over there versus, you know, credit cards and debit cards and people who had no access to the financial system or to like digital payments having it. And it's incredible. But US regulator, I just don't, I just don't see them taking that like heavy handed an approach where they're defining like the UX and the pixels and what it's going to look like. I just don't see that. 
whether that's better or worse, that, that's not for me to say. That's like a theory of governance. That's not that's not my expertise. So what I think we'll see in the U.S. and there's a there's Dodd Frank, which is like a a set of laws that governs like kind of financial institutions. There's Section 1033, and it talks. It basically says that consumers own their their bank data, their financial data, and there's going to be a regulatory implementation of that. There's going to be a rule announced in, in mid October of this year, and we believe very strongly that it will codify consumers' rights to access and share their financial data. And, you know, I think it'll put pressure on on banks and incumbents that aren't doing enough of that to do more of it. But it will be principles. It will not tell you exactly how you have to do it. And they will leave it open to companies like, like Platin or competitors to make sure that, you know, we provide a great experience on top of that. And once you have the regular, in the US, once you have the regulatory apparatus in place, the regulators are actually quite good about talking to industry participants and they will they will have interpretations of the rule and they will like push it forward over time. So, you know, you could imagine there's a new kind of financial product that wouldn't be covered by the rule and they will learn and then say like, oh, the rule does apply to this new financial product and here is how it applies. And so I think now we're at this point where there's been enough competition that the regulators are, are going to move to to that setup. That's how I see it. Speaking of banks, and you just talked about this, the knee-jerk reaction from a, a lot of banks for a long time has been, hey, it's my data, my IP, I'm not going to share it, right? But Plaid and the industry has gotten thousands of banks or financial institutions to plug in and share, connect their data, right? Why do you think Plaid has been successful over the last decade doing this? Well, I think because it's good for consumers and banks are large institutions with many stakeholders inside of them, many of which are heavily incentivized to do what's right for their consumers. And so like, I think one way, one way I like look at, at the history of Plaid is like, initially, right, we were small, then we allowed consumers to say like, hey, can you share my account routing number or my transaction history with this app? And we got that to work under against that 1033 law, the Dodd-Frank law, but it wasn't implemented. So we knew like the consumers could ask for this to happen, but there was no APIs, no system for it. And then some apps got built that were valuable. And, and so inside of these large banks, there were consumers were asking like their bank, like, hey, I want to use that app. And there are people in the banks who are like, yeah, that, that's a cool app. You should be able to like, share a bill with your friends on, you know, on Venmo. Like we don't offer brokerage services for, you know, like a, a credit union in, in America, like a s- small credit union in the middle of America. Like you should be able to sign up to Robinhood to straight stock. That sounds awesome. And so within all the banks, there are people who are advocates for open banking and open finance for sure. And yeah, you know, they may have some people in the banks may have different incentives. So maybe they used to be part of the bank that's doing loans. And 60 years ago, they were the only ones to have your transaction history. So when you want to get a mortgage, you just didn't have a choice. Like you just went to your main bank. But people's practices have changed. And so I think a lot of the banks now know that people are going to shop around for mortgages. They're going to shop around for loans. They're going to shop around for credit cards. And that was the reality. And so when Platt started to appear, it made it easier to shop around. It, it meant there was more competition in financial services. But it was also in line with a long-term consumer trend and expectation. And, you know, it's hard to go against a long-term consumer trend and expectation. Like, people have a lot of power, right? People want to use Mint. They want to use Robinhood. They want to use Venmo. They want to use Square. They want to have multiple credit cards. They want debit cards that are specialized to some use cases. They want to get cash advances. Like, people want all of those things. And when people want the things, it's hard as a you know, a bank is serving consumers. Like, you know, that's their business. They're not bad people. They're serving consumers. So they they will allow these things to happen. But it it does go again against like their historical competitive advantage of having this these kind of all these agopolies over, you know, people's spending histories. We like I, I look at that stuff like that is that is, you know, now it's done, right? Like all the large banks effectively are understand that this will happen, understand why it's good, and they've retaught competition, right? Like Chase, for me, is a bank that I admire because their digital capabilities and strategy 
I just said digital strategies. That makes me sound different than I like to think of myself. But their digital strategy is fantastic and their app is fantastic. And they're able to deliver very competitive experiences on trading stock, moving money around, like saving for a time and understand your credit as a lot of fintechs. Because they've internalized that they have to be competitive on product. That's how they're going to... And they are winning against other large banks who are not nearly as digital forward. And so the mindset there is more like, hey, this is inevitable. Let me become really good at it versus let this is inevitable and let me like try to stop this wave from happening. That's going to happen anyways. So generally, I was talking to a good friend who's been CTO of a couple of fintech companies, meaningful fintech companies. And he was explaining that any great engineering team and one of the hallmarks of the, this team is going to be that they are always learning from experiments, small experiments, larger experiments. Have you had an experiment within your team that, you know, the outcome of it really surprised you? I have two. One's a real experiment. The other one is more like qualitative research. So the experiment for me that I remember, so we, there's few you supplied experience, you get to the search screen and you have to search for your bank. And so you you type in, you know, like Bank of America, and then it, it'll, you know, it'll come up an icon, you can click on it, and then you can connect your Bank of America account. But in, in America, there's a lot of banks that have very similar names. So, you know, it's like First State Bank of Omaha, First State Bank of Kentucky, First State, because there are 10,000 banks in America. And so the search has always been improving the search, it's like we always find ways to make the search better. And this was a long time ago, but I remember there's a designer that was like, their head was exploding around this problem that there were too many banks with similar names and people would misspell them. And so you would have 25 search results and they all kind of look the same. And for small banks, people don't know what the icon looks like for the bank. They like, don't know the logo because they all they all look like important buildings in small towns. Like literally the icons like are so similar. And we just did this thing where we just honestly just added the URL of the bank because it turns out people know the URL for their bank because they're used to going to the website, even if they don't know the iconography of the bank. And that had a, a, that had a meaningful lift on conversion just to put the URL like under the name of the bank. And it was like, it was a, it was a cool little like US experiment, which was like so obvious after the fact. But it was just weird to put the URL there when we're trying to provide this experience that's not in a browser, you know, all those things. So that was a cool one. And we do we do a lot of experimentation for us on helping people find their bank and connect their their data successfully. And so there's always a ton of, of learnings there. And then the, so the second thing I'm gonna share, and this is the first thing that came to mind, but it's not a it's a qualitative research. So we in the experience of connecting your bank account with Plaid, there are a few pains, one of them, which we call the consent pain. The consent pain explains what's going on and, and, and it tries without having things buried in terms of service to be really clear with the user about what's happening. And then we have other, other screens where you log into the bank account and verify your phone number and your identity and all those things. And so we had done mocks of kind of futuristic versions of these experiences that we could do. And obviously the futuristic versions are very, streamlined. So there are fewer steps and all those things. And so we did qualitative research with people about them and we showed them the like one that we thought would be the best, which is almost like you just connect your account with just one click, like super magical. And the qualitative feedback from people, once the experience got too easy, is that it was scary. And the feedback was like, this is my finances and I expect there to be friction and I expect it to feel like, like it has weight. And if you make the UX instantaneous, like scans your face, connect your bank account, click once, it's jarring for people because it's so important. Like the thing they're trying to do, applying for a loan or like moving $10,000 from one account, it's so important that they expect it to be a little bit difficult. And they need that friction to feel like the weight represents the activity, the action that they're trying to do. And I just thought that was really fascinating for us, which is like, you, you realize you're not just optimizing for conversion you're optimizing for feel, like the feel of the thing has to represent the kind of action that that people do. So that was one of those, it was one of those places where the quality of research really like kind of changed the way that I, I thought about what we were optimizing for. And I thought it was a cool observation. And we have all these videos of people like 
normal people in the interviews basically like telling us that. So that was very cool. That's fascinating. Yeah, it reminds me to, you know, if you're pricing a logic product and it's not that expensive, you know, people are actually going to think this is not good quality. Very cool. That was a great answer. Thanks uh, for giving us those examples. Before I let you go, often in conversations, it comes up how in the last decade, a lot of the iconic companies we know today either were built on the cloud using microservices or they were migrated to the cloud, right? And then, you know, there's still a lot left to do in, in migration, but it was definitely a huge trend. Do you have a view on maybe a certain technology today within the tech stack that has the potential to also get huge in the next decade? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll give you like a multifaceted answer. First, I actually want to talk about the move, you know, to the cloud. We're clearly, I'm not going to say at the tail end, but we've, I think people understand the boundaries of what moving to the cloud means and, and how it's happening. And there are plenty of places in the economy where it's still in the process of happening, but I think it's right. It's kind of seen that, that seismic shift through. One of the things that's interesting about the cloud is initially, I think one of the big selling point for it was there's the economics of it, the ease of deployment. You don't need to manage physical infrastructure, but then for your users, they can access your service from anywhere, right? And they can access it because it's not like in a closet in your office. It's like on, on the internet, you can access it really easily. And another thing about the cloud is it allows different services to interoperate. And so there's a lot of vertical SaaS that are built right now based on this principle that it can access, you know, APIs of other vertical SaaS companies and, and share data and, and build better experiences therefrom. But, 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 if you're trying to build a company that's not just a vertical SaaS, but more of a horizontal SaaS, like one that really tries to combine all the individual vertical components together. And if you were building that company, you wouldn't want others to be able to access its data via APIs. And so, I think an interesting micro trend right now that could become a macro trend with consolidation is that there will become larger winners in SaaS who want less sharing to happen than I think we've been used to for the last decade in, in the SaaS world. And I think that's like an interesting open question. I think of a company like maybe like maybe like Workday is a system that's like notoriously difficult to get data out of as a third-party SaaS company. And that's because I think they see a lot of value in locking down the employee graph and the employee record for themselves, which is a very different strategy than say Salesforce, right? Where Salesforce is really easy to get the, the data out and you have this entire ecosystem of vertical SaaS companies that are built on top of Salesforce. So I think that's like an interesting open question on the state of APIs in the world. That obviously at Plaid, I believe in like open APIs and open data like quite strongly, right? For for consumers' financial data. But I think there's still a lot of open questions about where all that stuff will land. And then I, you know, the obvious answer, like the the second thing that came into mind after you 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 asked the question is I think the AI LLM space. I don't I don't think anybody knows what the second, third, fourth order implications are. And I think much like if you look at the first five years of the cloud, you wouldn't be able to predict today. Like it took 15, 20 years to get to the to, to the amount of, you know, cloud SaaS as, as we have today. I think I think LLMs will be a lot more than just summarizing things and and getting insights out of things and getting transcripts and whatnot. And the big question is like, what are the second and third order implications? And will those start to look like a platform shift? So one thing I'm interested in is how UI is impacted by AI. So right now, if I want to do something in a SaaS like, like Atlassian, you know, I click on issues and I find my ticket and then I go assign Bob. And then suddenly if I want to like look at epics, I go click on a couple other things and I see epics. And then if I want to see a third thing, I, I click around. And so my whole mental model is like I click and then I get a I get UX, like a UI for the thing I'm trying to do. And then I click somewhere else. But with LLMs, UI doesn't quite work like that. You say something like, hey, like out of my reports, who are the three with the most tenure? Okay, cool. You get the list. Then I'm like, okay, can you add calendar reminders two days before their next anniversary for me to like get something ready? And then you kind of want a calendar to pop up for you to be able to do that. 
And the way you do that right now is like you're in different apps, you're going down menus, and you go back up, you go on a different app. But with LLMs, you kind of have this expectation that it's just going to surface to you the right UX for what you're trying to do. I just wonder if the way we build apps in that world is fundamentally different. And what users will need to see is like the right components for the action that they want to do, which really come from very different parts of the various apps that they're traditionally using now. And I feel that way. And like one way you can like prove that that's the way it probably will go is you look at how many of these LM apps are like, they're all using Slack, right? And in Slack, they're showing you like a custom graph and an action or like a custom graph and an input box because they need to customize the UI to the thing that they're trying to do. It like doesn't fit nicely in the UI paradigm that we have of traditional apps. So I think that's like an interesting, will that be a platform shift? I don't know, but you could imagine a world where LLMs are pulling on UX and UI from a bunch of different apps to put in front of you what you're supposed to do. And then we would probably build like front end software pretty differently than we do now. I don't know if this is like the big platform shift, but I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what are the second, third order implications of LLMs? Because I would be shocked if that didn't result in probably not something, well, I don't know, maybe something as big as, as you know, migration to cloud. You're exactly right. You look at chat GPT, which I think almost the whole world knows about today. It's just a chat box, but you get all these functions done that normally would force you to click through screens and different UIs. And but this is just one simple chat. It's incredible. No, but fascinating stuff. Thanks for this conversation. It's been absolutely you know, informative, interesting, thought-provoking, however you want to call it. <laughs> But well, I'm sure it'll be popular amongst the listeners and, and, you know, we'll continue to follow you and Plaid. Look, I was really excited to be here. The questions were great. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. And I'm excited to listen to this episode, much like I'm excited to listen to all your episodes. So I'm proud to be here. You know, it's always cool when you hear yourself on something that you listen to. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this great episode with Jean Denis from Plaid. If you want more interviews, make sure to subscribe, follow, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever you get your shows. It helps and truly just means a lot. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts about the show, just drop me a line on Twitter or LinkedIn. Signing off till next week, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa.